real exciting to have our next guest here, ethnomusicologist from Columbia University. Please put your hands together for Alexan Tanus. <laughs> Alexan is here today Hello. to talk to us about sound and the study of sound on culture. Yeah, exactly. So uh, before I continue talking and building on what George had talked about in a very eloquent and pithy way, um, I'd like to uh, point out a uh, few of the scientific facts that we know about sound. Um, the the power, the true power of sound, and the hidden properties, uh, the good and the bad ones. And um, some of these properties we've known about for at least two, three centuries, and some things over dozens of centuries. And still, we're not really doing something very serious about it. So um, to begin with, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what sound can do visually. Uh, there's a study called cymatics. Some of you may have heard of it. Cymatics is the study of um, the behavior, uh, the visible behavior of sound, meaning if you put powder or um, liquid or um, any sort of uh, viscous material on a membrane or a plate and subject that membrane and plate to um, a frequency, you get different patterns, and these patterns are... A exquisite complexity and they change every time you change the frequency even just a few notches up or down so sound can make things manifest visually and um, it creates truly amazingly complex patterns now uh, Japanese scientist by the name of Masaru Imoto some of you also may know of him He's done, um, for good 20, 30 years now, a study on how music, sound, words, and even intention can affect molecules in waters and crystals. So this is really important that we know that we are mostly water, about 80% water. So how, when we're subjected to specific frequencies, words or even intentions of music, um, the structure, the molecular structure of liquids in us and around us changes. And he has two books out, and you can look at uh, numerous photos, even online, if you research his name, Emoto, E-M-O-T-O. E um, also, um, as if not so recently, actually, it's been happening for a while, but it's been taken more and more seriously, uh, sound is used in military warfare. Uh, there's a great book by uh, Steve Goodman uh, about the subject called Sonic Warfare. If you're interested, uh, research this up and, and you know how uh, sound is used uh, to, for terror or to fight and, and, and cause major harm uh, in a subliminal way or in a clear way. Now, um, also scientists, right now actually this is very, very recent, scientists in Russia are using frequencies to repair damage on the chromosome level and DNA. That's how much sound. This is, this, there are a couple of papers floating on the internet. If you're to research this, you can read them. Um, so we're finding more and more um, about sound, but things like cymatics and harmonic overtones, this is something that I'll talk about um, in a little bit of a detail. Um, it is quite a complex thing. Harmonic overtones or partials um, are basically uh, aspect of any sound that you hear, not just music, uh, studied by acousticians. Acoustics is a branch in physics that studies the behavior of sound. Basically, when we hear any note produced on any instrument, human voice or even by bird or stream or wind, if you analyze this note using electronic equipment or computers, you'll find that there's a ratio that is always replicated no matter where you start this note on a C, an E flat, or F sharp, and so on, and regardless of what instrument you're using. And 
this is an example of the order of mathematics, yet one of the order of mathematics that we witness in nature. I'm sure most of you know about Fibonacci number and golden mean and so on. Yeah, we all know about that. <laughs> this isn't your crowd, what are you talking about? <laughs> So basically, this ratio is always the same. If you're listening to C, that's the note that you hear the most when it's played on a violin, a ukulele, a human voice, or a string bass, any instrument. But um, you don't hear the overtones, the rest of the sound that's included with it. If you were to play this note on a gong, Tibetan singing bowl, or um, crystal bowls, and, and basically resonant instruments, you can hear few or a lot of these harmonic overtones. And it's always the same ratio. C, the next partial up would be an octave higher, an octave higher C, and then a fifth higher, a G, and then another C, and then an E in G, and B flat, and so on. And most people don't know that Western harmony came out of the harmonic overtones. All of these notes that are embedded in every note that we hear. Two theorists, monk theorists, started exploring with com this combination of uh, notes with another florid line, the melody, uh, which became later on known as the School of Notre Dame. This happened in um, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And this is how harmony basically started in the 11th and 12th century. It took a few hundred years for harmony to become what we know about. But without these explorations, we wouldn't have the harmony or the chords or, or this characteristic of There'd be no bone thugs in harmony. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I just crushed it. <laughs> so how did these monks realize that? We must have felt that there is some consonance. There must be some harmonic resonance that's guiding uh, human thinking and um, creativity because we are part of that system. So um, you will hear clearly these notes as I start playing um, in the sound meditation that I'm going to do later on, on the gong mostly, because you hear a wide spectrum of it, and on the Tibetan singing bowl. Um, now, um, yeah, uh, I want to tie this to the importance of sound in um, early religions and contemporary religions. For example, um, Hinduism and Buddhism make great use of meditation, and have used also instruments. And there was a very sophisticated science of metallurgy. Basically, metallurgy is uh, mixing metals together, and it's a very sophisticated level of chemistry. And this happened centuries ago. And um, in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, and gongs, Tibetan singing bowls, came out of this um, technique, which, um, according to scholars, uh, we got it from Sumerian. The Sumerians were to explore it first. So basically, um, if you combine um, seven to 12 metals, you'll have a metal, an alloy, that would allow you to hear specific overtones, these notes that are included in one note. And this is what gongs are in Tibetan singing bowls. Even further, when you start hammering on the plate, so putting the metal into stress and shaping the Tibetan singing bowl. And sound has been used for meditation for centuries. Um, so I will uh, talk about this meditation that we're going to do in a couple of minutes. Uh, of course, I'm condensing a lot of material into just a few minutes, but um, all of this is important for you to research on your own, uh, educate yourself. Coming to the noise pollution that we put up in the city, um, it's incredibly important to carry on you earplugs. In subways, whenever there's a fire truck ha passing by or ambulance or police, at least use your ears to block it. Very often, the decibel level approaches 120, which is the threshold of human hearing. This is painful. And if you're subjected to even just 80 or 90 decibels, uh, the exposure should be limited to just a few hours. And the higher you go up, 
the more damaging. And what happens if we get damage? Tinnitus. This is a constant ringing in the ear that there's no cure for, that does not stop even when you sleep. It's maddening. I have a few friends of mine who have played um, in, in bands and they damage their ears. Also, headphones is very important to not boost that volume up in a way to mask the noise that's coming from around you. Um, it's incredibly dangerous and far more dangerous than you think it is. Uh, you can buy these little devices now, decibel level measurement. Basically, they, they, they sell them now for $15, $20, just to have an idea of how loud things are around you. Now, what are some of the things you can do um, besides um, uh, taking care of your hearing? Um, you can um, first and most important educate yourself further about this, but also um, uh, attend uh, gong baths. This, these are meditations where you go and listen to gong, and attend sound meditations, and um, just witness silence. Truly, how pithy and profound silence is. Now. These instruments I use for meditation because um, basically when we're subjected to these overtones, and by the way, these overtones are not um, experienced on, um, on a lot of instruments uh, because they're not so resonant, but tonight we're going to uh, try them and uh, use them. So I want to leave really this amount of minutes so that we do the, the sound meditation. When you're listening, we're going to pass. Uh, are we going to pass? Yeah, is there, who doesn't have a mask? Does everybody have a mask? We have a couple people. I'll bring mm -hmm. another box over here. Most people have a mask. So what we're going to do is Alexan is prepared, has prepared a sound meditation for us. And uh, I know we're in New York City, and it's an open space. But we're going to blindfold everyone. So The whole point is to shut down some of the data going into your brain. Basically. What I'd like to do as you're listening to the instrument now, imagine how profound this experience will be in an enclosed space. Obviously, you're not going to get the real thing, but just a little example how powerful sound it is. But most importantly, when you're listening to the sound, don't pay attention to the sensory experience. Uh, to what, I'm sorry, pay attention to the sensory experience. Don't pay attention to the th thoughts that are going in your mind. Don't think of anything. Try to just observe. Basically. Um, all meditation systems promote just this very same thing, is not to have a judgment on what you're experiencing and try as much as you can to quiet the chattering of the mind. So just listen and try not to focus on your mind thinking about the sound that you're hearing. It's a tremendous experience. So you may wear the mask now and we're going to start it in just a minute.
gently come back to your senses. So once again, this is in public. It's hard to get better than this with two streets going by. But just wanted to tell you that if you're experiencing well-being, very often people describe, you know, sense of uh, therapy, healing, or whichever way you want to describe it. That's because your body is, secretes different chemicals as you're subjected to sound, and especially specific kind of sound. So the brain, this is known scientifically that the chemistry in the brain changes when we're subjected to music or any sound. And adding to this, um, the harmonic overtones do some harmonic resonance on the body. And if, you're, um, if you practice yoga and if you've been in shavasanas and, and you know that gongs are often used at the end, this is something that Yogi Bhashan, the person who brought Kundalini Yoga to the West, uh, started using at the end of uh, yoga classes because he realized that um, the overtones from a gong help instilling what one has achieved in a yoga session. So in a similar way, they're used uh, in meditation for the same reasons. And uh, also read a little bit about string theory, what physicists are telling us about what is reality, that everything we experience in us, around us, and in the universe is a result of membranes vibrating and creating 11 dimensions. This is known as string theory, 11 dimensions, brain theory or membrane theory or M theory, so on and so forth. So once you start looking into sound, you'll be dealing with ancient religion, you'll be dealing with neuroscience, you'll be dealing with chemistry and physics, and not just music. So take noise seriously in the city. Thank you Thank very you. much, Alex Antanus.